Hello and welcome to the first session of our course Introduction to the Achaemenids. My name is Plumas, also known as Dr. Laura Castro Royo, and I will be your tutor for the following weeks, your particular hoopoo bird to guide you in this adventure through the history of one of the most important dynasties in the history of the ancient world. Today we will be meeting a dynasty in a broad and redundantly introductory manner because to dive into the topics we will be discussing further, some steps are required in advance. If this is the first time you ever heard the words Achaemenid, dynasty, or you did not know who exactly these people were before enrolling in this course, do not worry the slightest. This is as advertised an introductory course and no previous knowledge is at all required. We will be starting from scratch and on the other hand, if you already know about the Achaemenids and the history, that's fantastic. You will have so much to bring to the conversation in our discussions and chats over these weeks. Remember that should you have any questions, you can post them or the designated space on Google Classroom and I will get on them as soon as possible. So are you ready to meet the Achaemenids? Let's start. Of the most important aspects to consider before learning about any historical period at time and space. And this is what we call the context. This is something I like to emphasize often. The importance and relevance of context is fundamental. We need to know when and where in order to properly comprehend and understand why things happen. Thus, we will start by situating ourselves in time and in space. Welcome to the Iranian Plateau. During this course, we will be located mostly in what currently is Iran, but not only here. The Achaemenid Empire was vast and varied, and its borders definitely did not stay the same for the centuries it lasted. Now, frontiers were variable. In fact, in one of our sessions, we will venture beyond the borders to meet the neighbors. But fundamentally, this is a space we will be moving around. I chose to display the territories dominated by the Ayavush the I because this was the largest the empire got. The colored territory, as you can see, covers much more than just Iran. We have the place. So now let's learn about the time. We will be cheating a bit for this one since we won't be starting exactly with the beginning or at least what is considered to be the beginning of the Achaemenid dynasty. We will need to take a step or two back and thus we'll be starting around 600 before Common Era. Oh, this is a relevant detail. For this course, we will be using the dating system BCE before Common Era instead of the classic BC before Christ. Nothing against the latter, it's only due to personal preference. As I was saying, we will be starting around 600 before Common Era and we will finish, well, actually in present time, because for our last session, we will be speaking about the Achaemenids in modern media. So you see, we have an extensive timeline to cover. Strictly speaking, however, the Achaemenids were around from 550 before Common Era to 330 before Common Era, when this dynasty sung its last song and finished existing. Now, let's learn some facts about the Achaemenid dynasty as a whole. I bet there is a lot of things you are asking yourself at this point. What are the sources we use to learn about the Achaemenids? They are varied and multiple, and perhaps not in the format we are used to. Due to a series of catastrophic events, which uh, we will deal with later in the course, many sources actually written by the Achaemenids were destroyed and lost. However, there are still methods to study them.
We use inscriptions to learn about the monarchs and their policies towards different subjects, like this one, for example, the Daiva inscription by Xerxes I. We also use tablets, like those in the Fertile Crescent. These are gathered in many groups, but among the most famous there is the Persepolis Fortification Archive and Persepolis Treasury Archive. These are mainly administrative text and you'd be surprised on how many things you can learn about a society via these sources. Of course, we cannot forget about art and historical artifacts. Through these we can learn about clothing, leisure time, even pets and diets. Art history and archaeology are incredibly useful to discover what text sometimes lacks or cannot simply tell. At the end of the day, something worth remembering is that all these disciplines complete a much more complex puzzle and fitting all the pieces is what gives us the proper portrait of a culture or a civilization. There is not a discipline superior to the other, rather they complement each other. This is what we call interdisciplinarity. Oh well, that was regarding the sources created by the Achaemenids during their time. But of course, we shall not forget about the Greek historians and their written sources. Even though these should be taken with a pinch of salt, because the vision of the Greeks was inevitably distorted, it would be a great mistake discarding these sources simply because they were not made by the Achaemenids themselves. And for a very, very long time, the Greek sources have remained the sole way to learn about this Iranian dynasty. So credit is due. Among the most famous Greek sources, we have Herodotus' histories, Caesar's Persica or Xenophon's Syropedia, among many, many others. Of course, modern times call for modern tools, so let me show you some of the amazing online and digital platforms we use to currently learn about the Yakimanids. We have a corpus of text in Edana, the Electronic Tool and Ancient Near East Archive. There is also the incredibly useful Akimanet.org. And then we have a full reconstruction of Persepolis in the Getty Museum, free to use and super accessible. All links to these sources will be available in this week's extra content document, so you can access it on Google Classroom. What languages are these sources written in? Because I bet you are wondering what the official language during the Achaemenid dynasty was. The official language of the administration and the court was Old Persian. But in such a varied and vast empire, you bet that was not the only tongue that one could hear. And you'd be correct. All the languages were also widely used, like Akkadian using the Babylonian dialect or Elamite. In fact, in fact, Elamite was the first official language of the dynasty. Some sources were even written in Greek. And another language that was used widely was Aramaic, sometimes called Imperial Aramaic by scholars because this was what we call a vehicular tongue, a language that almost everybody everywhere could sort of speak and communicate with. Using Aramaic, all the satrapies could communicate with the capital and between themselves. Aha, but that might be a new word for some of you. A satrapy, I said. What is that? These were each and every province that belonged to the Achaemenid Empire. In fact, the Medians already had satrapies and this administrative format would carry on during the Hellenistic and Sasanian periods too. The provinces were governed by a satrap. This was a viceroy to the king and the autonomy they held was notorious. So much so that the word in some languages has this connotation of corruption or insubordination when used to refer to a subordinate. This was not the majority of cases, of course. There was always insubordination and corruption, so let's start a movement to retrieve the word satrap from the clutches of misinformation, shall we? This word satrap, like many of us we used to talk about Iranian cultures, is borrowed from Greek, satrapes. And this is an adaptation of the word chusathapavon in Old Persian that literally means the protector of the province. 
each satrap was the administrator of the land they ruled upon. And sometimes the courts around them were very similar like the, like to the official court in the capital. So how big could they get? Among the duties, satraps collected taxes, had the role of judges, cared for the security of the roads and controlled the villages, cities and tribes in their land. They were allowed to have troops in their service, but they were carefully inspected and assisted by a council of Persians and different emissaries of the king. Among them, those who gained quite a fame were the eye of the king, who we believe were called Spasaka. We're not sure. These were people carefully selected to report directly to the king. Moving on now, from where did the Achaemenids rule and orchestrate their vast empire? There were many different capitals during this time and it kept changing due to administrative, economic and military reasons. We had Ekbatana as the earliest capital, then Pasargada, uh, Susa and Persepolis, even Babylon for a short period of time. We will be visiting some of them in this course, especially the heart of the empire, Persepolis or as the Iranians call it, Tarte Jamshid. Another question would be, what religion did the Achaemenids practice? The religions of the empire were varied and there was never a strict policy on what the different satrapies had to believe in. Each region maintained the religion once they were incorporated to the administrative structure of the Achaemenids and thus Babylonia kept their cults to the ancient pantheon with Marduk as the head in Egypt carried on with the religious practices and deities and the further eastern provinces like Parthia, Sogdia or Scythia also preserved the animistic cults and their own pantheons. The plot twist comes, however, when dealing with the topic of which religion did the Achaemenid elites practice. Do not fret, we won't be getting into that thorny garden, as poorly translated from Spanish, but I wanted to give you an informed view about the topic. Why? Because generalization does history and the historical reconstruction little favors. I rather you are being informed than just have you pondering that the Achaemenids 100% practice Zoroastrianism or Mazdaism. The subject is a bit more complicated than that. But something to bear in mind is that the Achaemenid elites were not that preoccupied with religion. We preserve very little inscription dealing with the topic of religion itself, but the kings used a religion-based language to express certain ideas. For example, the king equates his task of defender, protector and maintainer of order to that of Ahura Mazda, the head of the Mazdian pantheon. So there is a parallelism between royal and divine activities. Bear in mind also, however, that the Achaemenid kings never thought of themselves as deities. Please. It doesn't matter how many times we all watch the 300 together, that is and aims to be just fiction. But going back to the topic, yes, the Achaemenid elites practiced a certain form of Zoroastrianism or a dimension of it, but the topic is under observance still. I think the last question regarding this introductory session would be, were the Achaemenids Persian? Why do we use the word Persian Empire and where does it come from? Allow me to explain. Persian is what we know as an exonym. This is a non-native name for a group of people, place or language that is only used by those who do not belong to the group. The Greeks called the Iranians Persian because of one of the most powerful tribes in southern Iran, the Parsa. Also, one of the most famous Iranians of all time, Cyrus was Parsa himself. Thus, for the Greeks, the Iranians and the Achaemenids were, in particular, all Persian. Pars was the name of the southern satrapy, where Persepolis was, and even though the Greeks knew of the different tribes, such as the Mada, the Partha, the Saka, and much more, they started to refer to Iranians as Persian, and repetition creates a pattern, and a pattern creates a habit, and a habit creates a new term. 
Thus, it is not incorrect to call the Iranians Persians, but it is a term that I am not inclined to use because it feel, I feel it's incomplete, but it is not wrong, don't worry. You are more than welcome to use whatever you most fancy, of course, but I wanted to give you all the information. Did you know that the Achaemenid already had a name for their land and themselves? Their home was called Aria, and therefore they were the Aryans. All right, I think we have learned a lot about the Achaemenids for this first session. I am looking forward to the next one. Remember that should you have any questions, you can come to the weekly streams and make them in the live session, or you can join the discussion topic in the designated Google Classroom week. Have yourselves a beautiful day, Bacha. I will see you next week. Khodafes!